Thanks, Cosmin. Uh, uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to present here. So, and thanks for the organizer for the for putting up an uh, outstanding event. So this is joint work with uh, my two colleagues at UBC, it's uh, Ron Marino and Ali Lazrak. Um, basically, the, 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 by the way of motivation, let me just start with the, giving you essentially thinking about the, the traditional canonical corporate finance problem. And the typical plot that we see in this context features a typical gains from trade, which involves uh, an entrepreneur who has uh, ideas and no money and a financier who has money and no idea. So, and the typical solution, the variation essentially of this problem involves uh, things like calculating net present value of risky projects, rank projects, sell securities to like-minded uh, investors, in some cases deal with uh, uh, different forms of imperfections, agency, taxes, information frictions, and then essentially trust in the efficiency of the market to make the owners of the project rich. So that's kind of a nutshell, you know, the, corporate, the canonical corporate finance uh, uh, synopsis here. Um, and in, in, in what I just said, there is essentially an underlying assumption, an underlying paradigm that we marry when we make this uh, with statement, which is essentially the subjective expected utility framework, right? So here, uh, we, savage is everywhere, so individuals select action among, uh, among actions with risky outcomes by attaching a probability, a utility index to each outcome and a unique probability. And that's what allowed us to do all this analysis and all this uh, uh, NPV calculation that we just discussed. This is, um, I, I would say, this is a workhorse of finance. Uh, we use it all the time. Uh, we also know that this does not allow room for expressing our confidences in belief. So, it does not distinguish really between what horse races and coin tosses are. And we know, obviously, that this audience know very well, there's not been this, uh, this framework has been violated in the experimental setting. That's what led to the big literature on ambiguity. In a sense, uh, the message, the, the, the key message that I would like to send, we would like to send with this paper is that there's been obviously a lot of effort that's gone into in understanding ambiguity and looking at ambiguity in the context of portfolio choice and asset pricing. And I believe that, uh, we believe that the corporate finance is probably an area where ambiguity is, is, is reigns essentially everywhere, in everywhere that has been, uh, has been done. And yet, we think there's still little, little progress being done in that area. Our is in an attempt to go a little bit in that direction. So uh, this paper, in, in this paper, we, so we started with the grandiose idea of having treating uh, both aspects of the canonical, uh, canonical corporate finance problem. And uh, we narrowed down in the beginning to the first part of it, which is essentially what we do in this paper, which is the, uh, uh, handling the dynamic uh, corporate investment side of the equation, if you want. So a canonical model for corporate finance works well for um, risks that are well understood or are unambiguous risks, but it does not work well for risks that are unambiguous, and this, unambi so this ambiguous risk are potentially socially important investment opportunity that would be interesting to uh, have a tool or have a set of tools to analyze. So uh, in this paper, we revisit the canonical model with ambiguous, not only risk, not risky projects, and we try to ask ourselves what are the implications for investment and financing decisions. And as I said, may, most of the focus for this talk is gonna be on the investment decision, there's gonna be uh, only towards the, the end, I'm gonna make a foray into try to understand a little bit of imp possible implication for contracting and financing. So uh, to put things in perspective though, so we're gonna adopt essentially a multi-prior approach to decision making, but how do we get to multi-prior? Uh, I, I find it useful to have in my mental map the way in which we go if you want from a savage to a multi-prior setting um, we can actually achieve a multi-prior decision maker in a, essentially in two, two big routes we can take here. One route, which is the one that's been well-traveled and followed pretty much by all the papers that we have seen in this conference until now, starts basically from the experimental uh, uh, reason for why people have tried to generalize or, or, uh, or weaken some of the axioms of Savage which is basically the idea of weakening the independence axiom 
This allows us to explain Ellsberg type behavior. And uh, I label that kind of root the max mean expected utility root, MEU, uh, which includes obviously a large, large body of literature. The key feature of the left root there is the root that uh, in that setting preferences are, essential, are kept complete. So there's a complete order, but we have uh, a weakening on the independent axiom, which is relaxed and substituted by different, um, a variety of different axioms over there. Uh, the second route in which you can also obtain uh, decision-making rules that involve set of priors or multiple priors is the right route over there, which involves essentially a weakness, a weakening of a completeness axiom and preservation of all the other axioms of savage. And this is a route that is uh, arguably much less traveled and uh, because it leads essentially to incomplete preferences. So basically it leads to a situation where you cannot rank lotteries or you, you cannot rank acts when they are presented to you. So this is the, um, the, the route that Truman Bewley uh, uh, advocated or um, uh, formalized in 1986 and more recently has been uh, kind of the uh, becoming uh, more and more object of, uh, of, of investigations. And essentially, what we're going to do in our paper is to try to take those two um, reference models of decision making and see what they imply when we try to cast uh, those preferences or those process of decision making in the context of a very simple uh, real option uh, dynamic investment problem. Um, for an entrepreneur who decides to start a venture or expand or contract a, a, a venture. So, um, so it, it, the, uh, to summarize, basically, those two routes are, uh, we can think of those two branches as two ways of responding to ambiguity. One would be the aversion response, so that would be the Gilboish Milder branch. And the second route as is what I call there, maybe with a little bit of an abuse of uh, terminology, what I call indecisiveness. So we have essentially incomplete preferences, a la Bewley. And um, as I said, this, this type of preferences have not been used at least for, for I'm not aware of many, uh, much work done in finance uh, using these preferences with the exception of a relatively recent paper by Easley or, or in O'Hara who uses the, this type of Bewley preferences to look at market freezes in the CDO market during the 2007-2009 crisis. Um, so we believe that this is actually an interesting uh, thought to entertain, to have this type of uh, um, um, a unanimity type of preferences when it comes to corporate application, especially if you think about the fact that one could really relabel the decision maker entertaining multiple prior a la Bewley as uh, not necessarily one decision maker, but as a group making decisions. So if you think about a a financing syndicate or a management team, a board of directors, then uh, you can see that the, uh, the, if the board of directors act according to votes, according to unanimity type uh, rules, then basically the, the structure of decision really look like or can be mapped quite nicely into the incompleteness type of preferences that uh, the Bewley models advocate. So uh, briefly, to give you an, a sense of where we're going with this paper, a brief findings here. So in the, we look at the, uh, uh, to start with a very simple static context where an entrepreneur has an option to expand, contract, or, uh, um, or contract meaning shut down the firm. And we contrast the implication of those two, two models. We call the first one MEU, minimum expected utility. CEU stands for uh, consensus expected utility. Not surprisingly, in a, co in a static context, we see that basically for the minimum expected utility entrepreneur is reluctant to expand and eager to contract. This is a signature of aversion, right? So if you have aversion to uh, an ambiguous act, you're gonna stay away from it. You stay away when you have it and you stay away when you do not have it. Uh, on the other hand, the CEU entrepreneur is, uh, has an opposite behavior essentially in the case of contraction while it has the same behavior in, exp in, in expansions, right? So the CEU entrepreneur, as we will see, will be reluctant to expand 
and reluctant to contract. So there is essentially a built-in hang on to loser type of behavior, which comes from this uh, built-in endowment effect, essentially, that these preferences have. What uh, <clears throat> the static result is, is interesting in itself because it already generates a little bit of departure between those two types of the decision-making rule, but what most of the interesting, the, most of the interesting stuff actually comes out when we look at the problem in a dynamic context. And over there, we, we, we see that this, uh, this type of preferences, CEU preferences, uh, for this entrepreneur, the worry about predictable changes in, the, in their preferences has implication on uh, their time zero decision. So in other words, if I know that I'm going to be hang up with the project in the future, that is going to lead me to be even more reluctant at time zero to actually undertake that particular, that particular project. So there is an extra kick if you want, there is an extra uh, uh, reluctance that's built in in these preferences. And finally, uh, this is something that uh, we stumbled relatively recently into, uh, is an issue of dynamic inconsistency that actually is uh, uh, emerging in the, con in the context of preferences of the Bewley type. And, and this basically shows up, as we will see, in the form that the entrepreneur at time zero is essentially naturally at a tension with the itself at time one. So in other words, if he was able to pre-commit to a course of action, he would like to do things like start the firm and shut it down in the bad state. But uh, it's time one self is not going to do it when we get to that stage. And as a consequence, at, the, at time zero, the time zero entrepreneur, if you want to resolve recursively the problem, is not going to even start the firm in the first place. So we show that this if you, we call it a commitment problem because we have a recursive solution which differs from the pre-commitment one. Uh, we, we show that contracts in the form of, for example, of convertible bonds can be one way to, for the time zero entrepreneur to discipline, if you want, the preferences of the time one entrepreneur. And so there is a, a purely uh, commitment reason to issue a security like a convertible bond that allows to uh, uh, diffuse a little bit of this tension between time zero and time one. There's no financing reason for the convertible bond that we, we addressed, but there is a pure commitment reason for, for doing that. And um, we do not want to push it too far, but essentially, if you think about contractual form that we observe in the form of startups or in the form of early stages ventures, we, we observe forms of contract in the in the, in the form of convertible bond that can be linked to this type of particular situation. So ultimately, the goal of working on something like this is really to use the, the plethora of uh, results that we have or decisions that we observe in the corporate world or corporate lab to be able to uh, use those results to be able to tell us something about what are the plausible model of ambiguity or a, a plausible model of decision making that can help us understand some of the corporate decision out there. And so uh, basically this is a, in a nutshell the roadmap in which uh, we're, we're going, to, I'm going to go over. <clears throat> okay, so uh, in the interest of time I'm not going to uh, review the, the literature here and I apologize for the many papers that are, are uh, people in this room that are listed in this slide. I just want to emphasize that there is relatively a, a lighter version of uh, the lighter weight of the literature has been placed on corporate finance. And as I said, my goal here is to raise the attention of the audience to, uh, we have so many sharp minds over here, and I think the corporate finance is an area where our efforts can be actually put into to work in, a, in an interesting way. So uh, just to, before we get into the essence of what we actually do, just briefly preliminary so we, we understand the, the, the type of graphs that I'm going to show to you. I'm going to be working very simply with a risk neutral entrepreneur, which I will be labeling with an E, and who chooses among two acts. Uh, and in, in this case, I'm just going to uh, lay out what the preferences are. And those two acts, F and G, uh, by, dim uh, by dimensional acts, will pay out F, U, F, D, or G, U, and G, D. 
uh, an act is ambiguous, is labeled as ambiguous, if the entrepreneur believes that the upstate of that particular gamble occurs with the probability pi, and pi lives within a set. And if the set is not a singleton, then the act is uh, uh, labeled as ambiguous, and uh, with the degree of ambiguity is captured by this uh, parameter epsilon over there, and p is the center of the ball, essentially. An unambiguous act in a savage world, basically, we're going to deal with a, a set of prior, which is a set of probabilities pi, which is a singleton, and or in basically meaning epsilon equal to zero. So uh, the, the prefer th th these are the three, essentially we're going to be working with, with three types of preferences that we're going to contrast the solution to our investment problem in uh, according to these three uh, decision rules, essentially. The first one, obviously, expected utility, SEU preferences. F prefers to G if the expected value of F is bigger than the ex expected value of G under the prior P, which is the, under the probability P. The, that's the unique probability. MEU preferences, obviously, are expressed in terms of mean, a mean over a set of pi. And the, what we call the unanimity preference, uh, the Bewley type of preferences, have uh, this following characterization. F is preferred to G if the expected value of F is expected bigger than the expected value of G under the probability pi for all the prior, for all the probability pi in the set. So that's where the name unanimity essentially. This is a, the decision maker. Ha, this is the characterization that Bewley gives of the decision. Yeah, okay. One guy's set of prior. And you obtain as consensus meaning consensus among all the priors that you entertain in your head. Okay. So now that what I was saying is that you can relabel this if you want to express this type of preference as a preference of a group. But this is just a, a relabel. It's not, just, it's not what Bewley's result is about. So this is the characterization that Bewley has of preferences, incomplete preferences. Okay. So if I want to, because I, I, I would find it handy to represent this decision rule on a graph where I basically express in different curve or uh, better than sets and worse than sets. So I'm going to show that to you so that because they're going to come back to that quite frequently. So this is obviously for subjective expected utility. We were going to have a payoff in the up states and the down states. This is the gamble F. This represents the set of uh, uh, gambles that have the same utility as F or the same expected payoff as F. Uh, the upper part, the, the darker part, represents the better than set, and the lower part is the worse than set, 45-degree uh, line down there. Uh, the, max, uh, the, max, the minimum expected utility, uh, you could show that basically the, the, the way in which gambles are ranked in this setting is through, so the indifference curve for this decision maker becomes kinked at the 45-degree line. And uh, over here, you have the better than F. Over here, you have the worse than F. This is pretty standard. The slopes are related, obviously, to the, the size of this epsilon, right? So this is the P minus epsilon. It's related to P minus epsilon, and that's related to P plus epsilon. And uh, if I take the unanimity preference and the characterize on the same graph, you, that's what you obtain. You cannot talk about indifference curves, obviously, here. You have uh, uh, um, contours. Right, so you have uh, this F over here is your gamble. This region over here is the region of all the gambles that you prefer to F. This region down here are the region that, that, that you are uh, uh, worse than F. But also you see that in this area that's unhighlighted, this white area over here, you have, there's a region where you are in the side. There's no ranking. That's the, the nature of the incompleteness. You cannot decide whether this point on this 45 degree line is going to be better or worse than F. So that's actually, that's the nature essentially of the incompleteness. And by the way, this is what's going to play a crucial role and a very important role in the, in the implication that we're going to try to distill from our uh, investment problem. So uh, the unanimity is essentially is an incomplete order. What Bewley does, and obviously given an incomplete order, there's lots of things that you cannot do, right? So you cannot write down an index for the act. You cannot do dynamic programming in the typical sense. So there's a lot of, there are lots of stuff that actually go out of the window right away if you do not, uh, um, if, if the order is incomplete. So uh, Bewley essentially completes the order in a very draconian way. And it says, it does, basically adds what it calls a, 
inertia assumption, right? So it says, look, if you are, if you're a decision maker, uh, you identify as what, you, what he calls a status quo. And uh, if you cannot decide between uh, what, are you, what you call the status quo and an alternative, then you're going to stick with the status quo. So in the context of this example, if F is your status quo and I offer you a gamble on this unhighlighted region over there, you're going to stick with F. That is the built-in uh, uh, inertia, essentially, in this, in this type of preferences. And as I said, to answer to Jan Jun's question before, I could think of this set of prior of, of, of models that the decision maker entertains as either one decision maker or as a, a, a group deciding, if you want. And uh, which raises a lot of interesting empirical questions. For example, where do priors come from? How does the group define the status quo? Is the majority rule the rules that are used in the group? But we're not going to discuss too much about that. Okay, so here is the, this is how we're going to try to put those three frameworks, essentially two frameworks, MEU and C, and, and C, oh, by the way, what I called CEU, consensus expected utility, is basically the unanimity rule plus this inertia assumption, which is basically, CEU is what I label as the Bewley type preferences, okay? So I will be always referring to MEU, CEU, and I understand, just realized, actually, while I was <laughs> preparing and, and sub before submitting the paper, that uh, there's obviously a potential confusion with the Choquet expected utility when I say CEU. So I hope, <laughs> I hope uh, we're going to change that, obviously, in the next version of the paper. But uh, there's no connection with Choquet at all in this, uh, in this setting. Okay, so... Uh, the, the, the problem we want to, we want to study the simplest possible setup to see what are the, the key implications that we can get from these three, uh, these two simple decision making uh, frameworks. So uh, we basically look at an ambiguous random walk, as we call it, right? So basically there are two dates, at zero, time zero, time one, and time two. The, the reason why we want to have more than one date is because we want to study this issue of dynamic inconsistency that we're going to talk about later. And the, prior, the priors of the model that we look over here are independent over time. So we're going to be thinking of pi 0, pi u, and pi d coming all from the same set. And this is basically, these are the, the description of the evolution of the uncertainty in this world. So there's a pi 0 governing the first uh, part of the tree, and pi u or pi d governing the they are the two branches of the tree, and they are, you, sh you should think of those as independent uh, and drawn, basically, from the same uh, set of potential priors. So essentially, there's four states at the end of the world here. Um, so the real option problem here consists, very simple, at time zero, the entrepreneur decides if he wants to operate the firms or not by uh, committing a certain cost, unambiguous cost, I zero. If the firm is launched, the entrepreneur must decide at time one whether uh, he wants to continue, and which we label by C, in which case he keeps the scale of operation to what we call lambda equal to one, expand, and by expanding meaning paying a, um, an ambiguous cost I and increasing the scale of operation to lambda bigger than one, or contract. Contract meaning basically shutting down the firm, set the scale to zero, and receive a recovery value R, which again we label as unambiguous. Okay? At time t equal to two, cash flow is received, which is a function of the realization of the state times the scale. And uh, uh, they, uh, in this, if, for, for now, let's assume the entrepreneur has enough wealth to finance the project, and we solve the problem essentially recursively. Okay? Well, what does that mean? Well, we determine at time one the expansion, continuation, contraction decision. Anticipating those decisions, we're going to go back at time zero in a uh, sophisticated way if you want and solve the problem at time zero, given what the entrepreneur is going to do at time one. Uh, briefly, to give you an idea, graphically, I think it's easier to understand what the technology looks like. Uh, suppose that we're sitting at time one. We have the firm. We already started the firm. We can only be at time one if we did start the firm. So we're sitting over here. This is our, if you want, status quo which we call it the continuation uh, setup. If I scale up, basically scaling up meaning going along this ray by, uh, uh, by length lambda and then paying the unambiguous cost i, 
which basically makes me go down uh, in a, a 45 degree line fashion, parallel to the 45 degree line to a point lambda s2 minus i. This would be the expansion option. Uh, this would be the contraction option. When you contract, you shut down the firm and you receive an unambiguous uh, recovery value r, which is the, the uh, contraction. Now take this now and then superimpose those indifference curve or contour sets that we uh, discussed before. Basically, you get essentially the decision rules that the different entrepreneur is going to uh, they're going to express depending on their preferences, right? So here I'm going to, I'm reporting in blue is the indifference curve of the MEU, the Gilboa Schmeidler type of uh, entrepreneur. And in, uh, at time one, uh, where the status quo, the state of the firm now is in this point over here. And in red, we're going to, I'm reporting the contour set of the CEU guy or the Bewley guy. Immediately, you see that f to the left of the status quo, let's say S2, the two line coincide. So they have the same, the, there's no way we can distinguish them uh, from the point of view of uh, the expansion decision. Why? Because you see that if you expand, you're going to go up this ray and down to the left, and you're going to hit this line. And in this line, those two, the two criteria is essentially indistinguishable. And for that matter, you could think of those as subjective expected utility with a pessimistic P, where the P equal to P minus epsilon, essentially. Uh, where the action really is, is where those two, the indifference curve of the MU and the contour set disagree. And they disagree exactly on the right of this S2 point over here, right? So on this right of S2 point, this is where the contraction decision has, uh, is important. Uh, when you contract, remember, and let me flip it over here. When you contract, you shut down and you receive a value R. Now, whether you accept the, op whether you accept the takeover bid for R or not, it matters whether you are MEU, which is the blue one, or whether you are a CEU, which are the red one. Essentially, what it means, it means that the MEU is willing to give up the firm earlier or for a lower value of R than the CEU, which intuitively basically means that because I am endowed with this firm and I'm looking at the all possible uh, scenario in the world, the, the scenario in the world that makes me the most robust from a point of view of a CEU would be the case in which the firm is very valuable and I'm giving it up. So that will be the cutoff that will make the CEO entrepreneur to accept the takeover bid, if you want, will be much higher than the cutoff that will make the MEU entrepreneur to give up the firm. So that's what I meant originally, that we have this situation where the MEU is eager to give up, while the CEO has more hung up, is more reluctant to actually give up the firm because of essentially this uh, uh, endowment effect. Essentially, if you think about it, it's like having a bid and ask a spread built in here. Right? From the point of view of a, a, a Bewley type, the red guy over there, the MU guy, he wants to get rid of the, and the, the, the red guy has an ambiguous uh, urn, which is this S2, and uh, he's willing to give it up as long as you pay him an R, which is slightly above this blue kink over there. Okay? So the mean so he, he basically assesses his own firm has the minimum value of S2 under his uh, set of priors. So that is the the critical value at which the guy is going to be willing to entertain an offer to relinquish the firm to somebody else. So the mean uh, the for the MU is going to be using the, the P minus epsilon to assess, and the other guy is using the P plus epsilon, essentially. Okay. Okay. Now this is in, in a static sense you could get this essentially with transaction cost. It's essentially oh, basically the same idea as having a transaction cost built in here. Um, so what things when things become interesting is when you start putting this into a dynamic context. Now think about you are. At, at time one, we have solved this problem. So we found, obviously, uh, under, obvious param under param different parameter value, obviously, you can solve all possible 
combination of decision at time one. Uh, but we're going to be focusing on a particular combination of parameters that give us an interesting implication when it comes to dynamic inconsistency. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> so what you're pointing out is that if I'm running the firms, if I, if I own it, I know more about it. And hence, my, the prior that I... Uh, all the possible probabilities that I'm conceiving about the states over the payoff, I mean, will give me the same distribution for my firm. Yes. Well, if I'm buying this firm... Well, you, but... but uh, that's true, but you're not buying. So the, the alternatives here that you, I'm comparing with is, in this particular case, suppose that there is a takeover bid coming in in cash. So now you, you, so you may be uh, very well knowledgeable about your firm. That's still a, a risky, or an, an, unless it's a risky project or an ambiguous project, which is obviously more ambiguous than the offering cash that's, been, that's made to you. So in terms of if I want to think in terms of probability sets, <coughs> you attach a smaller probability set to your knowledge of your own firm. But what's coming in is, a, is an offer in cash. So it's a completely unambiguous alternative. So I know, I'm not sure whether, uh, because if the alternative is another, I understand if the alternative is another, taking over another firm's, uh, then we get into the situation that we do not know whether the set of prior that I use for my set, for my firm would be, uh, I should use the same as what I use for another set. So that's, that's the problem that we're actually not uh, addressing here. Okay, but we can discuss it further later. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, I wanna emphasize, I wanna basically look at the specific case for the dynamic problem, which looks at the, the following constellation of, uh, of parameters. So the constellation that I have here is the following. In, uh, I think about the problem at time one in the up state. Yeah, in the up state, uh, we consider the case when in, in the good state, everybody under all preferences, we're gonna expand. In the down state, uh, we're gonna uh, contract. Everybody's gonna contract with the exception of this uh, CEU entrepreneur who will prefer to continue because basically under the, uh, the, 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 the you know, essentially is, uh, He's a victim of his own uh, uh, status quo bias, okay? So that's, uh, I think I have a way of uh, showing it graphically if, if I don't mess up, let's see. Yeah, so essentially this is the, the idea. This is the up state. In the up state, this alternative over here, which is the expansion, is preferred to, every, to, to the contraction alternative. The contraction is in the worse than cone. Uh, the, in the down state, I want to po position myself in this particular configuration of parameters. Expansion is not chosen by anybody. Contraction is chosen, which is this point over here. Contraction is chosen by everybody, S, E, U, M, E, U. But I choose in such a way that C, E, U is not going to go. So C, U is going to be stuck with the continuation option here. So I choose the recovery value in this particular uh, uh, region. All right, so what we show here in this context, the impact of future delays contraction for the SEU entrepreneur, may, so the CEU entrepreneur makes this entrepreneur more conservative at time zero. And uh, the other two guys are gonna go ahead with the project. The CEU, because the CEU anticipates the fact that I'm gonna be in, if I go ahead, I'm gonna be in a state in which I do not contract. This is very painful for me. I'm not gonna do it in the first place, okay? This is fine. Uh, this solution is dynamically consistent, but what is interesting here is the, is the following. The time zero entrepreneur would like, 
if we were able to pre-commit, he would like, we show that he actually would like to start the firm and contract in the down note. That would be something that he would like to do. But he, but he knows that if I do this, time, my time one self is not going to actually shut it down. And therefore, that's what, uh, what comes up here. In other words, this, this type of preference, because of this change, if you want, in the status quo, naturally lead to what we call uh, a, a the disagreement between a pre-commitment solution and the recursive solution. So to summarize again, the entrepreneur would like to pre-commit to undertake an action in the bad time, shutting down, but the entrepreneur knows that when the decision times come, he will not follow through. And as a consequence, he will not invest. Okay? So uh, just to give you the flavor for why this is happening, uh, let me just simplify a little bit the model and give you in a nutshell why this is the case. Right? So suppose I take the model before, ignore one branch, just look at the down branch. And let's suppose that we take two decisions. A decision at time zero, you need to choose between F0 and F1. And at time one, you need to choose between two gamble, F1 and F2. And let's suppose that the gambles are reported on that picture over there in the following way. So if I look at this as a, time, as a dynamic decision, and let's suppose that I want to construct the recursive solution. So you start at time one, and you, and you say, look, I'm a CEU entrepreneur. Shall I choose F2 over F1? Well, uh, F2 is not in the preferred then cone. Uh, I stick with F1. Then uh, fine, so that would be the decision that would be implemented at time one. Now, let's go back to time zero. Well, I need to choose between F0 and F1. Well, again, is F1 preferred to F0? No, it's, the no, co it's in, the, in the no decision cone. I stick with F0. F0 will be the recursive solution uh, that will prevail, prevail here. But now, let's think about a situation which I, I asked F0 guy, suppose ignore the fact that you, to get F2, you need to transition to F1. Would you like to take F2? So would you like to pre-commit to F2? And the answer is yes, F2 actually is preferred to F0 if I were able to ignore F1. So, the, the, so this picture helps us also in, introduce the last thing that we do, which is basically uh, how can we just get, uh, how can we uh, remove this inconsistency? Essentially, if you want to make the pre-commitment similar to the uh, equivalent to the recursive, you want to move this F2 out of this gray region. And moving this F2 out of the gray region is basically you need to alter the payoff. And essentially, that's what we claim a contract could do. So if you basically, at the time zero entrepreneur would like to, were able to issue securities, uh, derivatives of, of, uh, different, of different form, or in other words, we show that we can engineer derivatives in such a way that this payoff essentially get, either this payoff gets pushed out of the critical region or if you want, the status quo at time one is changed in such a way that thing is going to go out. So uh, in the, the example that we work out, we have a, a set of elementary contract design in which this can happen. We call it the stick-like uh, contract or a carrot-like contract. It turns out that you can actually package them in a way that look like things that you observe in reality, like convertible bonds. And we do an example with a convertible bond uh, where we choose, we engineer explicitly the face value and the recover and the conversion ratio in such a way that in the state in which the entrepreneur or each, without the contract will not be willing to shut down, this guy, the, the exercise strategy of the bondholder penalizes the entrepreneur in such a way that the entrepreneur actually is going to go ahead and shut down in that state. So uh, under these conditions, well, this is just the, 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 the proof is, is in the paper, but basically the convertible bond penalizes for not contracting in the down state, and therefore the entrepreneur invests at time zero, expanding the up and contracting. And so basically this is in a nutshell. And uh, to conclude, um, uh, I hope I convinced you that there is a lot, there is a, a richness of problems that we can address in corporate finance. And uh, what we just, we're feeling that we're really scratching the surface when we think about uh, trying to go after this very basic uh, corporate finance problem. And um, uh, we think that there is a, both from a theoretical point of view as well as from an empirical point of view, there's a richness of, uh, of um, problematic that we can, uh, we, can, we, we can put our efforts on. So thanks for your attention.